Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Definition, and this episode we're breaking down Hereditary. It's a film that I've never actually covered before on the channel, but it's always been one that I revisited due to all of the things laced throughout it. There's an overall sense of dread and eeriness to the entire work, and the movie is laced with hidden details that really add to its creepiness. Throughout this video, we're going to be going through some of the scariest things in the film that you may have completely missed whilst watching it. There will be heavy spoilers here, so if you haven't had a chance to see the movie yet and don't want anything ruined, then I highly recommend that you turn off now. Make sure you subscribe to the channel for videos like this every day, and if you enjoy it, then please drop a thumbs up. With that out of the way, thank you for clocking this. Think you get it? Click, click, and clocking. Now let's get into our breakdown of Hereditary. Okay, so the film opens with an obituary for Ellen Lee. There are several details within this that hint at certain aspects of the movie, and on repeat viewings it fills in more and more of the gaps about the character. Not only was Lee the grandmother and mother to the family that the film focuses on, we also learn throughout the movie that she was the queen of the cult of Payman. Payman is one of the eight kings of hell, and when researching the figure, I learned that his powers included the ability to create visions, acquire servants, make spirits appear, reanimate the dead, and grant flight, which are all things that we see happen in the film. Before the events of the movie, we discover that Lee had attempted to offer up his son Charles as a vessel for the demon. We learn Charles' name in the opening obituary, and it becomes important later as it plays into what's really going on with one of the central characters. Charles committed suicide, accusing Lee of trying to put people in him, and though this was diagnosed as schizophrenia, we know from the events in the movie that this wasn't the case. Because of his death, Lee was unable to give payment a vessel, however that didn't stop her from trying, and she waited until her daughter Annie had a son named Peter. At the time, they weren't really on speaking terms, and thus she was unable to use him in a ritual to summon the spirit. Years later, Annie and Lee repaired their relationship, and Annie had a daughter named Charlie. Charlie was of course named after Charles, and from what we know, the cult then set their eyes on her. There's lip service paid to Lee telling Annie that she wanted a boy, and this is exemplified in one of the customised mats that Lee made for the child, which has a name as Charles instead of Charlie. The cult successfully managed to put the spirit of Payman into the girl, however Payman desired a male body, and thus he did not bestow upon them the riches that they seeked. Though we see the events unfold from the perspective of the family, the film centres around the cult transferring the spirit of payment from Charlie into Peter, all whilst carrying out the rituals that enable this possession to occur. Now from the off, there's a ton of foreshadowing, returning characters, and just things in general that don't pay off until the end. Annie makes miniatures, and we initially start off with a slow pan across one, which then becomes the real world. There are a ton of theories that exist around the symbolism of this, but personally, I believe believe this almost dollhouse-like aesthetic shows that the characters don't really have any agency or control over the events that play out. They are like dolls, unable to move and divert from what's happening, and this is given weight by the story of Heracles, which pops up in one of the many classroom scenes. We learn that the character was a pawn in a hopeless machine, and that he didn't really have any control over his fate. Dolls appear throughout the film, and they too have a lot of meaning to them. The miniatures depict key moments in Annie's life, and she uses them as a sort of therapy to understand the situation. However, they could show that the cult were controlling it all. Charlie too makes her own dolls, and later in the film in Joan's apartment, we do see that she has them too. This layout of the candles and dolls does slightly resemble the ending shot for the film, and it perhaps suggests that everything is being controlled by the cult from the shadows. We first meet Charlie sleeping in a treehouse, even though it's freezing, and this is where Payman would later return in the movie in order to complete his rebirth. It's a great way to recontextualise our introduction to the character in both the opening and ending, and it adds a lot of subtext to the events that are going on. At the funeral, we see a creepy man smiling, and he later returns in the film, standing in a doorway. We also see a strange symbol that is worn by Annie and her mother, and this brings a lot of implications with it. The symbol appears throughout the movie at several key points, and it belongs to Payman. One of the most important instances in which it appears is on the post which Charlie gets decapitated on. It's painted in blood in the attic of the property, it appears in one of the cult members' homes against the wall, on the cover of one of Lee's books, and it actually ties back to Payman himself. 
In one of the depictions of the character that we see in the literature on him, we can see that there are three heads hanging from his camel. These three heads would later be toned down and repurposed to make the symbol, and the three heads of course represent the three beheadings that we see throughout the film. These are required to summon payment, and they happen with Lee's corpse, Charlie, and Annie at the end of the movie. Now what the funeral does is that it tells us that the cult have always had their eyes on the family, and there's a really creepy moment that you might have missed when first watching the film. Before the family return home from the funeral, we can hear footsteps moving about the house. I'll play the clip of this twice now with the volume increased, but listen closely for the sound of people walking around the house before the family enter. Did you hear that? Well, we do learn later in the movie that there had been cult members which had drawn a triangle in the house and transported Lee's body to the attic, so it is likely that at least one of these instances happened here. Annie seems relieved by the passing of her mother, but she's haunted by an apparition of her in the darkness, and from here she attends a grief meeting. It's here that she meets Joan, who we learn was second in command to Lee, and throughout the film we discover that she's now the cult leader. There are several clues that something is off with her throughout the movie, and at the meeting when the leader asks if anyone would like to speak, Joan immediately looks to Annie, perhaps subliminally forcing her to talk. Joan slowly sparks up a friendship with Annie, and they bond over their grief. Joan tells Annie that she lost her son and grandson, and they perform a seance in which she proves the latter's existence through the use of his favourite chalkboard. However, there's actually a clue that this is a lie, and when Annie bumps into her at a car park, we can see in the back of Joan's car that she's purchased a chalkboard set which indicates that this was all a ruse. We also see at one point that there are letters and flyers piling through the letterbox of the home, and then a one for a seance is produced over the top of them. This was to call Annie to attend it, but after she didn't show up, Joan had to intervene. Payman's light draws characters to certain things, and throughout the film it appears at numerous times to lead them down a certain avenue. This is never more evident than when Annie is in her workshop. At the right hand side of the screen, we see the light appear, and then Annie seemingly knocks a paint pot over, which draws attention to Joan's number. However, if you slow the scene down and look very, very closely, you will see that the paint pot actually falls over on its own, and that Annie never actually touched it. This was the work of Payman. The light also appears in Charlie's room and leads her outside. We see footprints in the dirt and also a woman burning a fire. She's stopped by Annie, but it does show that the light guides people to certain places. Payman's light can be seen in the classroom before Peter sees a reflection of himself smiling, and it too can be seen coming through the rafters when he starts to choke. I'll talk about this smiling later and what it could symbolise, but for now we'll just focus on the light. There is later a fade in from a scene to the miniature which shows Charlie's death, and at points a bowl does look like the light, suggesting that Payman was complicit in the beheading. Those are the more subtle ones, but it is littered throughout the film. Speaking of beheadings, Charlie cuts off the head of a bird at one point, and we later see a drawing of it in which the beak looks similar to scissors. We also see a model of houses stacked on top of each other, which suggests the idea of homes and families built on those that came before, and how Lee's goal was always to connect herself to the demon in order to obtain the power that it would grant. Though we don't learn the ins and outs of all of the rituals that are needed to summon payment, there are actually a lot of clues going on in the film that suggest the necessary steps that one must take. Firstly, there is the three beheadings that need to take place. On top of this, we learn in the Book of Payment that the target must be vulnerable and drugged with a special herb that will open them to possession. This is called the Dittany of Crete. We later see that Lee fed Charlie this as a baby in her bottle, and when Peter is smoking under the bleachers, it is likely that he too was drugged with it. We do see that his friend on the left hand side appears towards the end of the film bowing before Payman, so it is likely that it was put into his system here. When Annie is drinking tea at Jones, she pulls a herb out of her mouth in disgust, and this is the same one that allows the spirits to enter their lives. Payman marks his prey by making their own point in a specific position, and we see him carry this out on Peter. This has ties to the illustration of him, in which we can see that his staff has a bent wrist and hand at the top. It too returns at the end of the movie and reminds us of that headbanging scene. After the death of Charlie, Annie starts to lose her grip, and she turns to Joan who tells her how to conduct a seance. Annie performs this with her family, and it opens them up to Payman, who is able to tear them apart and take over Peter. The group slowly start to close in on them, 
and throughout the film we can see several of the cult members. There is of course the aforementioned one at the funeral, but when Peter is smoking outside of his window, we can also see the breath of someone standing there watching him. A woman can be seen waving to Charlie, who later appears in the attic, and as things ramp up for the climax, we can slightly make out in the darkness several figures standing around the house. When Annie fully loses it and is taken over, we can also see her hiding in the top corner of Peter's room. It's enough to give you nightmares, and it's a scene that I've pointed out time and time again to people because they haven't actually noticed it with the attention mainly being focused on Peter and the lighting of the movie obscuring her. For the climax of the film, she stalks him throughout the house and hides in the corner of another room before making her play. Annie chases Peter, but he manages to make it to the attic and she can be heard banging her head against the door. She somehow manages to get in after this and beheads herself, and if you were wondering how this was possible, there's actually a clue hidden in the darkness of the loft. That's because when Peter enters it, we can see cult members standing in the shadows, and they likely unlock the door and let her in. Peter, scared for his life, runs out of the attic, going headfirst through the window, and he dies upon hitting the ground. If you pay close attention, you can actually see the shadow of his soul leaving his body before Payman's light comes in and takes over. The ending theme itself has a mix of bells and trumpets, and in mythology, this is said to accompany Payman when he comes to Earth. He travels to the treehouse where Charlie slept at the beginning and finds that Lee and Annie's corpses have been reanimated and are now bowing to the statue of him with the bent wrist staff. Joan gives him his crown and explains to him what's going on and she actually calls him Charlie instead of Peter, showing that this was always his original identity. The camera pans out to an almost model-like structure once more, showing that he has arrived. We then cut to credits, however the creepy aesthetic isn't over yet and we can see in the names that one letter turns red and then drops down to the next name, symbolising the hereditary nature of passing something on through our genes. Now as for the smile earlier in the movie, I do believe that there was a secret agenda by Payman to separate Peter from Annie. We see his reflection smirking in the classroom, even though we know that the character was not. After Charlie's death, the relationship between the two breaks down, and Annie complains that Peter won't admit that he's guilty, and that he always has a stupid face on his face. I don't think that's the exact line, but you know. Anyway, it is possible that this was Payman doing this in order to drive them apart, and he was forcing Peter to smile even though the character didn't want to. We also see Annie sleepwalking throughout the film, and dreaming that she set Peter on fire. She also tries to pull his head off at one point, and this could be her subconsciously trying to save her son from being a vessel for the demon. There's a ton of things going on, and no matter how many times I watch the film, I always spot something new. I'm glad that I finally got around to covering this, and obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on the film, and if there's anything I missed. Comment below and let me know, and if you enjoyed this video then please give it a thumbs up, and make sure you check out our breakdown of the insane details of Midsommar, which is going to be linked at the end. We go over the hidden faces, subliminal messages, and more, so it's definitely worth checking out if you want something else to watch. If you want to support the channel from as little as 99 cents a month, then please click the join button below. We massively appreciate it, and as a thank you, you get access to content early. If you want to come chat to us after the show, either follow us at DefinitionYT, or click the Discord link in the description below. Those are the best ways to keep up to date with heavy spoilers, so hopefully we'll see you over there very soon. This is a channel for people who are mad into movies, so if that's the kind of thing you like, hit subscribe. Huge thank you for taking the time to watch this. I've been Definition, you've been the best, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.